This is the bed that Abraham Lincoln died in. I'm just a girl, a wonderful girl. Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today I am in Chicago, Illinois, and I'm at the Chicago History Museum. I have never been here before. I mean, I've been to Chicago before, and I'm surprised that I've never been here before because when I like when I go to places, I like to um, learn about the history, and this place is just chock full of Chicago's history. So let's go in and let's learn learn a little bit more about Chicago. So right outside the museum, before you get inside, there is this big. Well, I thought it was like a big hunk of coal, which I mean, it's not far from it. So apparently. This was a molten mass that was left over from the Chicago fire of 1871. And it was discovered um, when they were digging a foundation for a new building where a hardware and cutlery store once stood. And it said that the fire's intense heat melted parts in the store to form this giant mass which weighs about 13,000 pounds. So this is a relic of just molten metals and things that were in that hardware store um, and they dug it out when they were when they were um, you know rebuilding so I just wonder if like if you cut into this if you could see like forks and because that was a cutlery store but that's pretty neat really if you think about it this is all just relics from the Great Chicago Fire. Wow. Mark just pointed out, you can see, like, th this looks like some sort of, like, a, a box of some sort. It says you can see nails and screws in here, too. It's just amazing. This probably right here looks like it might have been a nail head. That is just really, really cool. I don't know. I just really like things like this. Pretty amazing. So when you walk in, this is amazing. You've got the cinema sign, the gas for less sign, this balloon sculpture representing Chicago. It's very children-y in here today. Lots of, lots of kids. Okay, we're gonna start in the Abraham Lincoln Gallery. They they recommended that we start up on the top floor. Oh my goodness, this is a life mask of Abraham Lincoln with a plaster copy of the original mask that was made in 1865. Oh, it says this mask made the day prior to Lincoln's 56th birthday depicts president a few months before his assassination. The physical and motion strains of the Civil War were clearly visible, causing a death-like appearance. Yeah. It says that Lincoln, who slept little and ate poorly during his pre presidency, looked like an old man by the war's end. They've got a flag we mourn our country's loss, but this bed, this is the bed. This is the bed that Abraham Lincoln died in. This bed right here, which was across the street from the theater. Many years after the assassination, Mr. Peterson sells Lincoln's deathbed to a private citizen who in turn sells it to another guy who is a collector of historical memorabilia. That is amazing. So he was shot and killed um, in 1865. And he's carried across the street to the Peterson house. He's taken to a small back room and placed upon this bed. He's six foot four and he doesn't fit. So he was placed at an angle. Throughout the night, dozens of people came to visit the dying president. Wow, that is unreal that that is the bed that he died in. That's incredible. It's kind of amazing here. This was a watch that was given to Abraham Lincoln in 1861. When Abraham Lincoln was running for president, he was obviously very much against slavery and used that as part of his campaign. You can see this is a torch with axes 
um, that was a campaign torch and axes in 1860. So it's just really interesting that they have all these artifacts that are in here. The Council of War 1867 is a sculptor right here. And then here is the Proclamation of Emancipation that was printed in 1864 right here. That is pretty amazing. Wow. And this is the 13th Amendment, the ceremonial copy from 1865. It abolishes slavery, slavery in America after it passes Congress. Uh, Lincoln signs several ceremonial copies, this being one of the ceremonial copies that he had signed. You can see his name right up there. Like, right there. Amazing. He's come to see the dying president. Early the next morning, after Lincoln's death, Secretary of War Stanton proclaims, Now he belongs to the ages. Every time I stop recording, I see something else. I'm like, oh, did you see that? So Mark had pointed out that right there, zoom in a little bit more. This is an actual playbill from the night in 1865, April 14th, when Lincoln was shot. And it said that they were trying to, um, you know, promote it basically to get people to come to the play. And so they advertised that Lincoln was going to be there, which as we all know, may not have been the best idea in, in hindsight because, you know, that man right there, John Wilkes Booth, decided it was a perfect opportunity. And so it's pretty fascinating, though, that that is the actual, an actual playbill from that night. Laura Keene was uh, a famous actress during that time, but it's amazing. So this area that we're at right now is just like an, basically like an art gallery. And this painting was painted an oil on canvas in 1896. This was after he had passed away. Henry Col Colcord was the artist. Um, and it was based on a photograph that was taken of Lincoln in 1860. So going in this room next, you can see they do have a lot of like old advertisements and things like that on the walls, which is really neat. We've got this room is it's like maybe like a lot of like sports memorabilia, Chicago White Sox. Oh, look at that little guy. He's neat. The elder vice guy. He looks like a little cutie baseball player, kind of. Look at him! There's Shoeless Joe Jackson, who's in the scandal of being accused of throwing the game. He was banned. Well, it says that Jackson and seven other players were indicted for throwing the series. Although a Chicago jury acquitted them, baseball commissioner Ken Saul Landis banned all eight men from baseball for life. Wow. So we also got the Bears. Mark just pointed out, look at the football. It's a lot around. It's a lot different now than what it was then. And then we've got the Chicago Bulls. Oh, gosh, the 97-98 Chicago Bulls team. That would be no problem. So this is Scotty Pippen. Scotty Pippen's jersey. And then we've got the Blackhawks. We have to represent. Whose shoes are these? Dennis Rodman's shoes. During 1997 postseason. Haven't heard much from Dennis Rodman lately, have you? I wonder what he's up to nowadays. The Super Bowl Shuffle. Man, that was awesome. Ed, Ed McMahon. I had a huge crush on him. And look, right there, there's Dennis Rodman sitting right next to Michael Jordan. Oh my gosh. I meant Jim McMahon, not Ed McMahon. 
like something, no. Ed McMahon, no. <laughs> Jim McMahon, yes. So here's the display about the Century of Progress, which was the World's Fair in 1933, 1934. And it happened during the Depression. So they didn't, they couldn't get their, the government funding and stuff. So it was a lot of private citizen funding the World's Fair. And I didn't realize that the State Fair, it was, it lasted for two years. When you think of it, you just think, ah, it's just like maybe a week long. No, it was two years long. So they came up with this Art Deco design, which is like the Art Deco design. The final product was a rainbow city stretching across three miles of Chicago's lakefront. So it's really pretty neat. So this picture right here, it says a pleasure zone of thrills and attractions. The Midway featured alligator wrestling, freak shows, and Sally Rand's fan dances and other diversions. That sounds like a good time, actually. You can see here are some of the little souvenir pieces, um, the Century of Progress. I've actually sold an inlaid box very similar to that. Had no idea. But look. Look, Nick, you can get into the freak show. Now this is a good time. We got the freak show, the freak, the freak animal show, the torture show, the Irish village, the Moroccan bazaar, the infant incubator, house of tomorrow, streets of Paris, and everyone's favorite, Midget Village. You could do all those attractions at the Chicago World's Fair. A century of progress. Sometimes it's fun to look at these old pictures. This is, you can enter Belgium right here. But sometimes it's fun to look at these pictures just to see how people were dressed to go to the fair. If you think about like going to your state fair, you don't see people dressed like this. This guy is looking pretty casual though, I have to say. He looks like he's got a little velour jumpsuit on. But you can see the lady in their heels and the men in their suit coats, the ladies in their hats. That's not the way people dress to go to the fair nowadays. Times have changed for sure. So this is an aerial view of the state fairgrounds. Mark just pointed out that the rat skeller. There was a there's a restaurant, I think, in Indianapolis. It's like a beer place, but that like there's like cellars and stuff, so that's probably like where the booze was. Um, and this was in the nineteen 30 what 33 so it was after prohibition and then we've got the roller coaster here and the amusement rides and then i th think that might be the planetarium i don't know i'm trying to see if there is a little thing on it well here's the hall of science man it would be cool if that was still all here this is the world's fair in a nutshell look at the little the little ticket that's still attached. It's amazing to me that all of these things, like all these paper goods and stuff like that, are still around to be displayed. So these are just some snapshots that an amateur photographer, O.L. Cook, took. Um, he said that they took more than 900 pictures of the Century of Progress during his many visits to the fairgrounds. Um, just shows a lot of candid pictures that were taken. So this was the Enchanted Island, the Hall of Science, which was that right there. But again, looking to see how people were dressed. I love that. This is the Midway. So there was these Skyliners too, almost like a little ski lift. So this area right here talks about designing of the fair. And this was Bertha Palmer. And if you've heard of like, I, I believe, I haven't read that part yet, but I think the Palmer House Hotel, she probably, that's maybe was her family, but she was, um, she had a lot of social influence um, to lobby for women's representation at the fair. Uh, so she was elected president of the board of lady managers and she helped plan the women's building. Um, and their goal was to present a complete picture of the social condition of women. But this little sterling silver medal was gifted to her in 1893, and it was created by Tiffany and Company. And you can see, isn't that cool? It's got rubies in it. I mean, and even the little case that it came in is pretty neat as well. But 
You go, Bertha. You represent us women. Well, and I, I need to correct myself. When I was talking about Bertha planning the fair, she was actually helping to plan the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. It became the crossroads of the world, attracting a lot of, a lot of visitors, including nearly 14 million foreigners. Um, it was a stunning setting of white neoclassical buildings, lagoons, basins, and canals. The fair represented American products, innovations, culture, achievements as a testimony to this country's social, economic, and um, technologically, a technological progress. Quite the feat, though, too, but, you know, people of color were vastly underrepresented in this Ida B. Wells in 19, or in 1892. She came to, to protest and um, kind of stand up for the people of color who were non-represented in this, in this, uh, the Columbian Fair. This colored folks day so is to be an extra house. inducement to have him come. In such numbers is a vindication of our wisdom and of our good nature. I am glad that we have cheerfully embraced this occasion to show by our spirit, song, speech, and enthusiasm that we are neither ashamed of our cause nor of our company. It is known to many of you that there is a division of opinion among intelligent colored citizens as to the wisdom of accepting a colored people day at the fair. This so one thing that Frederick Douglass did, he, um, he made a speech at the Colored American Day in August, on August 25th, 1893. Um, so, you know, they wanted to make sure that their voices were heard. And what, what an amazing and scary thing for these, these people to do. And I have such admiration um, for their willingness to stand up and fight for their rights. So they should be honored much more than they are today, for sure. Here's a little fun fact. Um, this was a program from Buffalo Bills the, in the Rough Riders. He did his show at the fairgrounds. Uh, he rented a pavilion just outside of the main entrance for his show. But we can see Frank L. Frank Baum. Um, this is like, a re this is a anniversary, 100th anniversary edition. Um, from the year 2000 and he actually visited the Colombian World Columbian Exposition and it, the Emerald City is like a take of the the white city that was represented in the World Columbian Exposition. You now we have some the shoreline you know Chicago has a lot of shoreline Lake Michigan look at this men's bathing suit that's a snazzy little number it says it was a blue knitted wool. Wool. Look at the little cutouts there. That's pretty snazzy. So then White City, the amusement park, opened in Chicago's South Side in 1905 and became a beacon of wholesome entertainment for middle class families. It was named after the World Columbian Exposition, which we just talked about over there. It's a place where people could, you know, escape real life for a while. But this little booklet has um, some candid photos of, of it. What is this? Lights illuminated the chutes for a nighttime riders to splash into the pool below. Some of these rides and stuff, it just makes you wonder, like, were these, like, how safe were these rides? Look at this. It's like a big bumper boat ride. Yeah. But it says, once more popular than Riverview, a 1927 fire in the hard times of the Great Depression drove White City into bankruptcy in 1934. I mean, that just makes you wonder how safe are those rides? Are they? Are you buckled in? Do you have a safety bar? Oh my gosh! Look at that. <laughs> That's so crazy. So this room just has like retail artifacts that were around different centuries different eras um, in Chicago. Credit, you can buy farm equipment on easy payments. So we're kind of starting over here with 
some general things of pattern books, some pocket watches, some mail order items like telephone, the clock, the sewing machine, and the lamps, and the gramophone. Look at the typewriter from good old Montgomery Wards, Sears and Roebuck. And looky here, there's little safety bricks there. And look, it's a little Shirley Temple from 1933. This section right here makes me happy. These are all like products that were invented by people who are from Chicago or invented in Chicago. And like the Lincoln Logs, Tinker Toys, John Lloyd Wright, who was the son of Frank Lloyd Wright, supposedly conceived the idea for Lincoln Logs in 1917 when he watched the construction of his father's Emperor, Emperor Hotel in Japan. Tinker Toys was the creation of Charge Charles A. Pajot and his partner Robert Petit. They debuted in 1914. I had a set of Tinker Toys when I was a child and I loved them. Mark, you had Lincoln Logs, didn't you? I had both of them. Oh, I didn't have both. I just had Tinker Toys. I didn't have Lincoln Logs. But the little cobbler's bench. So, play school. Lucille King, she was a former school teacher employed by Schroeder Lumber Company in Milwaukee. She organized the Play School Institute with another teacher in 1928 to manufacture wooden preschool toys they had used as teaching age. Aids. Purchased by the Joseph Lumber Company and relocated to Chicago in 1938, Play School Toys encouraged children to learn while lifting, pushing, pulling, or pounding. I think everybody had one of those little cobbler's bench. And look at this. The radio flyer wagon. That's a little creepy. Look at him. He's on his big giant radio flyer. But Mr. Machine, Mousetrap, the Yickety Yak Teeth. Also Ron Popeil. Um, Brunswick bowling balls, Sunbeam mixers, Bell and Howell pictures, the Weber grill, Wilson tennis balls, double mint gum, Morton salt, cracker jacks, macaroni and cheese, continental coffee, and Quaker oats. All uh, by Chicago inventors. Oh, and, and the bicycle. I didn't even go down this part. Yeah, the, Schwinn. the Schwinn with the banana seat. That's amazing. World Book Encyclopedias. You know, as a, I'm a vintage and antiques seller, and um, you know, you see pieces like this a lot. And the tubular steel, the S chair, you can see it kind of is shaped like an S, was um, it, it invented around 1935. Um, during the war, 1930s, the W. H. Howell Company became the country's leading manufacturer of tubular steel furniture says it was less costly to make than wood. Tubular still suited the marketplace of the Great Depression when American consumers on tight budget sought quality merchandise without sacrificing style. He made thousands of these S chairs to use in the kitchen with a Formica tubular steel tables. We all love these tables now. Frank Lloyd Wright, who, was, who lived in Chicago, he designed this table here and these chairs. It says walnut sewing table circa 1907 designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. That is really really amazing. He had a very he was very much ahead of his time with this art deco feel. Wright designed the table for the Avery Cooling House in Riverside, Illinois. One of Wright's more ambitious projects, the house had separate wings filled with furniture designed by the architect this just interests me a lot just because it has to do with school and education, but the Edward Wurst um, educator, he was an educator and craftsman, he actually believed teaching children skills that they could use in life. He believed that instruction in areas of production such as textile weaving and pottery making would teach children skills beyond the tasks that they were completing. He developed a manual arts curriculum that rela related handiwork to nature study, math, and literature. In doing so, changed the way students were taught in Chicago public schools. Um, almost like the grandfather of like a vocational type school setting. Um, and why not teach children skills that they can actually use in life? 
later on in life. And the whole house, artisans of the whole house, settlement houses acted as agents of change for the people that they served. They also created new female-dominated institutions where women gained knowledge and expertise that they used to shape public policy. So the, um, they worked at the whole house and they lobbied for reforms in the neighborhoods, like playgrounds, sanitation, um, libraries, housing, the, the monitoring this, this, the child labor laws. So, and it said that the Illinois Juvenile Court Act and Illinois Mother's Pension Law, two important progressive era reforms, passed with the help of whole house residents. You can see these whole ceramics and metalworking classes were among the many of activities offered at the whole house art school. And these are some of the pottery pieces that were that were made there. It's just really pretty cool. Pottery from the whole house. And we've got some copper work over here as well. But, and you can see these, Jane Addams pioneered the American settlement house movement. Jane Addams, along with Ellen Gates, star opened Hull House, a new immigrant neighborhood in the near west side. Look at these little boys, aren't they so cute? This is around 1900 when this photograph was taken. But the Hull House provided social services for the urban poor and hosted meetings of ethnic clubs and la labor organizations. Um, so I just think that, you know, and it, it really shaped these, these children who, you know, they gave them skills. And she fought for improved working conditions, uh, maternal and child health care unions, and child welfare. So we're going in this little room of Chicago jazz and blues. You can see the high chaparral in person, B.B. King. With coming attraction, Ray Charles Duke Ellington. And then it says Chicago once reigned as the capital of American film and television. Chicago dominated the American film industry in about the turn of the century. But then, you know, they, the, the, they all, the studios decided to all move to California where the weather was nice all year. Um, but Ch during the 1940s, Chicago became America's television town. So you can see, we're going to see, I think, some exhibitions in here of some of the, like the Bozo show and that sort of thing that were all filmed in Chicago. A lot of silent films were done here in Chicago. I remember this puppet. Madame, I don't know why I do, because this is way before my time, but this is Madame Ophelia, Ophelia Ogopus. She's from 1955. Fran, Kula, Fran, and Ollie. I don't know why, but that is like the things at nightmare. She's she's like a, a pre Lady Elaine. It, and you may have seen it on like WGM. Maybe. When they're not anything else. Look at her, Lady Elaine Fairchild. That's who she reminds me of. Oh wow, there's Kukla and Ollie drawings so this is pretty spectacular this is a restoration of l car number one number one right here it is so you think of chicago you think of the l the elevated train line l car one once transported people from the loop to the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Jackson Park. This long-term loan from the CTA was installed in 2006. Tens of thousands of visitors has hopped on board to enjoy this iconic piece of Chicago history. That is amazing. Boy, look at like all the detail on the windows and stuff too. Oh, no, maybe we can't go inside. We can just look inside. We can just look inside. They've got like this weaved, let's see if I can zoom in so you can see the back, it's like all weaved. The back, the back rest, I guess. And then there are like little stained glass windows up at the top, like little glass. It's so neat. I love this. This is the kind of stuff that I just love. This is part of, definitely part of Chicago history for sure. The South Shore, is that what that says? South Side, South Side Rapid Transit. 
and then you're kind of up here on a platform like a train platform it's pretty neat. just wanted to get a little bit better of a view of L car number one it's amazing I love stuff like this oh look did you guys know that Oscar Meyer was Oscar E Mayer Meyer Meyer Oscar E no Oscar F Meyer he was a Bavarian immigrant and he learned sausage making at Armour and Company before opening a shop with his brothers in here uh, 1240 1241 North Sedwood Street Street but look you could have got wieners in a can right there all meat wieners packed in brine this is pretty amazing this is was part of the headboard you can see in this picture right there from the Palmer House Hotel that amazing Wow it's just amazing that is fancy schmancy it says made of ebonized and gilded wool wood in Renaissance style the headboard from the Palmer House Hotel had an elaborate French style canopy as you can see in the picture there that green at the top was the canopy a pair of pedestals at the foot of the bed served as corner supports for a settee that formed at the footbed. The bedroom set also included a dressing bureau, writing desk, center table, and, an, and upholstered chairs. Beautiful. This room that we're in right now talks about the Chicago Fire, which was in 1871. Um, and this kind of shows um, the, Chicago was basically built out of wood so that a lot of the structures, even the sidewalks and streets, were all raised and made out of wood. So very flammable. And they were talking about um, there was an artist here, uh, a Civil War illustrator, Alfred Wad, captured the scene in a series of dramatic sketches. You can see these are some of his, there he is. But these are some of his sketches depicting people trying to flee with their belongings. Few artifacts did remain, this bowl and sauce set, and then this beaded necklace that's all fused together. And there's more um, relics and things that were found in the, in the ashes. And you can see this is the aftermath after the fire. And they had to, you know, basically rebuild everything but there's a little baby doll with no head these damaged everyday objects found in the aftermath of the fire are a sobering reminder of the number of children and families who suffered terrible losses they said over a hundred thousand people lost their homes over 300 people died in the fire so it was um quite the tragedy for sure it just kind of fascinates me just goes to show you the resilience of people that you know everything can be destroyed and then they they rebuild it's pretty amazing so this doll right here it says when the great chicago fire struck six-year-old charlotte mcnally and other family members fled for their lives she carried her favorite doll to safety and decades later donated to the chicago history museum and this is saying that soon after the mayor, Roswell B. Mason, and members of the Common Council assembled the first congregational church, they immediately passed an ordinance banning the sale of liquor and established a temporary relief committee to provide food, clothing, and shelter to fire victims. They also enlisted ordinary citizens for police duty, fixed the price of bread to prevent gouging, and asked residents to avoid using kerosene lanterns. You can see right here, this is a map of Chicago, and all of the thing that's red, that's all of Chicago that had suffered from the fire. That is quite amazing. So this is a model of the water tower that still stands here in Chicago, and this is one of the few buildings that survived the fire, and it was like um, surrounded by flames, but it was built from Indiana limestone. <laughs> So it survived. This is pretty fascinating. So poor old Catherine O'Leary and her cow. So there was the legend that Catherine O'Leary, who was a poor Irish immigrant, lived with her husband and three children 
um, on the southwest side. She kept several cows in a barn behind their home and sold fresh milk for income. Although the fire started near or in their barn, an investigation by the Chicago police and fire commissioners, they couldn't determine the exact cause. But she was she became the scapegoat. You can see there she is and all of her cows in her barn. There's the, the bucket getting knocked over. But the blame lingered for more than a century. And in 1997... The fire was in 18, what, 1871, 1990, the fire was in 1871. In 1997, she was, she was formally absolved from any guilt related to the fire. So that's all a myth. Poor old Catherine O'Leary and her cow got blamed for it all. Probably because to her, due to her uh, social and economic status, she became an easy scapegoat, but... 1997, she was finally cleared, well beyond her death. Looky here, this is an actual painting by Norman Rockwell, and it is it is entitled Mrs. Catherine O'Leary Milking Daisy. Uh, so Mrs. Catherine O'Leary, who did not start the fire, she didn't start the fire. Yep, there's a lamp. Move it. The cow's like, it wasn't me, I swear. Pretty amazing. And then here's another... Rock, Norman Rockwell, the clock mender. This, these were both done in 1940. But I love Norman Rockwell. Pretty neat. She didn't start the fire, nor did her cow. And here we've got the gangland Chicago, which is what Chicago is pretty notorious for knowing. This is the remnants of the St. Valentine's Day massacre. But it all stems from bootlegging and prohibition and all that sort of thing. But the quote at the top of this display, everybody calls me a racketeer. I call myself a businessman. When I sell liquor, it's bootlegging. When my patrons serve it on a silver tray on Lakeshore Drive, it's hospitality. And that's pretty true. It was not far from the truth, but so, yeah. Ugh. We actually saw the wall, the actual wall um, that was taken down and rebuilt. Um, at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, you can visit the the actual wall that these men were were killed upon. They've got this display here. These are all remnants of things that happened that were left over from the fire. We've got the stacks of coins that were all fused together. Those looks like toys that are all fused together. The pocket watches, this melted goblet, and then all of the stacks of silverware that are all fused together from the fire. The pieces of pottery. Some survived. It does look like Raku. And some of it survived without any damage. Some were burned badly or fused together. This area has little dioramas. This is the diorama of the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. I love these. I don't know if there's a button you can push to make it light up anymore. This is just what we're looking at, but isn't that cool? The little miniature people and all the buildings and the statue and the dome over there. That's fun. Okay, so that was our experience at the Chicago History Museum. It was great. There was a field trip going on in there, so apologize if there was a lot of children in the in the but you know what they're learning in here too. So it was a really great experience. So if you were in Chicago, I highly recommend, actually I recommend coming here first before you do anything else because it does give you a little glimpse into other things that you can look for when you're visiting the city. So highly recommend the Chicago History Museum. Thank you guys so much for watching and going with us. Um, if you're in the Chicago area, make sure that you stop in and we will see you in the next one. Bye guys. Hello friends, thanks so much for watching the video. Don't forget I have a second channel, The Misty Show. I would love for you to come over and follow me. Also, don't forget that I have live sales every Tuesday at one o'clock Eastern, right here on my YouTube channel. And go ahead and check out the Virtual Antique Marketplace. It is an online antique mall. There's lots of different booths and lots of different sellers. So go check that out. The link to everything is down in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching the video and I will see you in the next one. Red hot mama, red hot mama, but I have to turn my temper down.
a girl, a wonderful girl, I'm the sweetest one in town. You can search for miles around, and no one like me can be found.